Uh, our next panel is titled, with as much or as little accuracy as all the other panel titles, Justice, Hubris, and Moral Issues. We're fortunate to have three really bright people here to talk about the issues they think are interesting about de-extinction. Hilary Bach from Johns Hopkins University, Jay Odenbaugh from Lewis and Clark College, and Ronald Sandler from Northeastern University. Hillary is first. No, I do not want to join your wireless network. Oh, it's a very nice wireless network. I'm sure it is. Okay. So, I've been asked to talk about justice, and I thought first I would just say some very vague things, and then I would take justice in the sense in which I suspect it was intended by Dr. Greeley, um, which is as a way of taking him up on his general set of questions about what, what to make of the argument that we have a special obligation to bring back, I don't have any such thing. But a special obligation to bring back species that, that human beings rendered extinct. So just to get some much more general points out of the way at first, um, I should say that reading your article um, in preparation for this, My and James. sorry, what? My name James. Yours and James. Yes, well, I was sort of looking at sort of both of you because I don't have my glasses on, so I actually can't look at anybody except in a sort of general directional sense. But I was looking at this, this article and, and noting the use of the word moral to describe a certain class of objections. And I was going to say, I, I, I say this in the nicest possible way because I think I understand why the two of you chose that word. It, it gets used this way. But moral philosophers, at least as I understand us, we don't like to focus on what I think of as the weird, spooky objections, at least a lot of us don't. The objections like, um, is it playing God? Is it reversing natural selection? And so forth. I think I said in the last meeting that I have never quite understood what exactly the problem is with playing God. Um, but in the, the way that I like to think about it, and the only way I found that makes sense, is not as using a power that ought to belong only to God, because I think any power that we have is a power that we can think about how to use and whether it's possible to use correctly without bringing God into it. But I think that playing God in the objectionable sense involves doing things that would make sense only if we had God's omniscience. You know, so it's not his power, it's his knowledge that's crucial. So if you think about something like creating an entire ecosystem from scratch, that's the sort of thing that would make sense only get if we had God's infinite knowledge. Not having God's infinite knowledge, we should not do that. So I tend to think, I'm not really worried about playing God. I'm really not worried about reversing natural selection um, for any reason other than a prudential one sort of in the same way in which I don't worry about things like whether or not doctors should, should use their unnatural power to bring people back after they've suffered some sort of serious cardiac arrest. I think, you know, well, you could say something like that's playing with the power of life and death, but mostly we don't. Mostly we say, no, we're actually pretty cool with people using that power when they can do it responsibly and when the person hasn't, you know, hasn't been dead for so long that their brain has suffered some sort of horrible, irreparable ghastliness. So I'm not worried about those kinds of problems. I don't really think there's anything specially strange and spooky about de-extinction. And to the extent that someone might suggest that there is, I would want them to try to cash it out in some fairly serious, detailed way. On the other hand, I am, well, I should also say I'm, I'm also not sanguine in the way that Stuart Brand sometimes, well, sort of seemed to be. When you were talking about trolls and how trolls infest discourse, I think some, that's true of some discourse and the opposite is true of others. At least my careful study of academic faculty meetings has convinced me <laughs> that a lot of times, well, about half the time people use something that I refer to as cost analysis 
and the other half benefit analysis. And cost analysis is where you say, my God, there's a cost, we can't do it. And benefit analysis is where you say, my God, there's a benefit, we must do it. And trying to sort of put these two things together and get cost benefit analysis is comparatively rare, I find. But it is not the case that there's only cost analysis. Sometimes there's benefit analysis, as in the run up to the Iraq war. And it's really important, I think, not to make assumptions about which, because I've never been able to figure out exactly which kind of issue triggers what kind of analysis. So I think it might be that people are just going to be alarmist about the dangers, but on the other hand, it might be that they're sanguine about the risks. And so for this reason, the only thing I've ever found to do is just to look very carefully and try to figure out exactly what the risks and benefits actually are. To my mind, one set of risks and benefits involves animal welfare. Um, I have done a certain amount of research into animal cloning, uh, sorry, not research in the sense of actually performing this animal cloning, but philosophical research in the sense of trying to figure out what exactly it is, which has led me to the concluded, conclusion that a lot of it is, that it involves an enormous amount of, to my mind, largely needless animal suffering because of the prevalence of very serious birth defects, as witness the 12 minutes of life of that ibex which probably were not 12 very happy minutes, I would imagine. Um, they're suffering due to inbreeding. Presumably, if you bring back a population, that population is going to have some pretty serious genetic bottleneck, at least at first, until you get the first gazillion or so individuals in this species back. And that means that you're going to have more birth defects due to that inbreeding. If it's a social species, you're going to have, a, you're going to have more suffering due to lack of conspecifics. You're going to have suffering if you have a lack of habitat, unless you're dealing with one of those cases in which it's a relatively recent extinction event that you're trying to undo and in which the threat has been removed. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. It seems to me there are just a, an awful lot of problems that one really needs to think out very, very seriously in advance. And you know, so I think that those problems are serious and real. For my part, I'm less worried off the top of my head by the resource diversion problem, just because, as I think you suggested, the resources would probably be different. I am, however, extremely worried about your political issue, and, and partly because it seems worrying in the abstract, and partly because I think, you know, there are questions that I'm not an expert in, and you are. And I would think that, you know, political resistance to the Endangered Species Act is just about as clear an example of something that you're an expert in and most of the rest of us are not as one is likely to find. And therefore, if you tell me that this is going to be a political nightmare for protecting existing species, I am inclined to say something like, okay, that's that, game over, period, goodbye. But I don't get to say goodbye because I have to give the rest of this talk. But. Anyways, I, I, I am inclined just to take that as, to my mind, a game ender, as long as it's true. That said, I think that if we were talking about sort of sane persons, um, which might or might not be you know, overlap to some unspecified degree with the US Congress, um, but if we were talking only about sane persons, I'm not sure it ought to be that big of a problem. I recall, again, cases in what I was thinking about um, about animal cloning, there were people who were saying such fascinating things as, hey, as soon as this gets going, we're going to clone racehorses. And I was like, oh, no, we aren't. Once you see what this involves, somebody's going to get the clever idea of doing this. It's going to cause suffering to that horse. That horse is not going to be able to run. And if they do run, that horse will not win. And then everybody will say, oh, that was a pretty terrible idea, and it will never be tried again. Right? It seemed to me this is what was likely to happen. And in this case as well, I think that the the amount of resources it would take and the difficulty of doing it and doing it right would lead people eventually to say, you know, this is really not a substitute, except in very limited instances, for prevention efforts. In the same way that if they look very carefully at, let's say, the California condor, they would not be inclined to say something like, well, let's just kill all these animals off. We can just bring them back from the brink of extinction. I mean, it is the sort of the your grandmother or your aunt case that somebody mentioned there about you know the fact that we can bring people back from the dead does not mean that it has not induced most people to think it doesn't matter about people being about to die. So now I get to the main topic, which is justice. As I said, I take justice in this context to mean not something like, you know, what would be fair 
because I think that's probably not a useful way of looking at, at this topic. It's not clear who we would want to be fair to. I, I imagine that what justice means in this context is, is it the case that we have a special obligation to bring back species that human beings have helped to extirpate? So I think there are a number of problems that you might raise about this, some of which I'm going to raise and put aside, and then some of which I'm going to raise and take up at greater length. So. First question, who exactly would we owe this obligation to? The animals? They don't exist anymore. So I'm going to put this aside and say, OK, I think that that's an interesting question. But it seems to me that you can be obliged, first of all, just to the cosmos. At least I think of myself as having obligations to the cosmos. You can be obliged to beings who don't exist anymore. So for instance, if I had made a promise to somebody who had then died, I might be obliged to that person still, I think, to keep my promise. But more to the point, I can be obliged not to anybody in particular. Um, I, can be, I can be under an obligation that makes it the case that something is something I ought to do. And it doesn't really matter whether there's somebody to whom I am obliged. If you think that's right, then I think it ought to not matter so much whether we can identify somebody, and if so, who that somebody might be, to whom we owe an obligation, for instance, to bring back the passenger pigeon. right? Because if it is the case that in virtue of our conspecifics role in having extirpated the passenger pigeon and driven it to extinction, then if it's the case that that means that we are obliged to bring the passenger pigeon back, then the question who we owe that obligation to is of secondary importance. And it might be interesting for moral philosophers such as myself, but not in this company, I think. So it's something I might think about in my copious free time, but not in the preparation for these remarks. So secondly, the second question is, OK, well, in virtue of what relationship to the people who drove them extinct do we owe this obligation? Well, it would have to be, it can't be because we're their descendants because we might be and then again we might not. It would have to be because we're their conspecifics. And you might ask, do we owe obligations in virtue of everything or for that matter anything that our conspecifics did? You know, surely not. I mean, and if you think even about cases where it's more plausible to suppose that we might owe such obligations, like if you imagine, say, um, Say, if some member of my family had done something unbelievably horrible, I might then feel impelled to try to make up for that horrible thing. I might think, you know, this was my sister. You know, she ran over, you know, your entire family with her pickup truck. I must make it up to you in some fashion, right? Even there, though, you might think, well, it might be that I owe this, but then again, it might be that you know my sister and I broke a long time ago precisely because she was such a horrible, irresponsible person. I've tried as hard as I can to keep her from doing these stupid things with her truck. You know, but at a certain point, responsibility comes to an end. And you, know, you might wonder, hasn't responsibility come to an end a long time before we get to our conspecifics, possibly in different centuries? Right? And you might think the answer to that question is yes. In any case, I'm not going to sort of worry so much about that anymore because I want to get to a couple of other questions, which is, first of all, what is it that we are, that we are obligated to do if, uh, so I'm just going to presuppose for the sake of argument, A, it doesn't matter who we owe the obligation to. Um, it doesn't matter even if there is such a person. And B, let's just play along with the idea that we have such an obligation in, in virtue of being conspecifics. OK. So the question is, OK, what are we obliged to do? So I take it the answer to this question, well, what are we obliged to do, actually, is the second question. But the first question is, in virtue of what are we obliged to do this? Um, well, it's got to be that our conspecifics extirpated some being. But well, what is it that we are obliged to do to make up for this? The answer has to be something like, we're obliged to make good the bad thing that we did. We're obliged to try to set the world right to take this bad thing and make it no longer be the case about the universe. There is no possibility, I think, that we could undo the suffering that was caused in the process of driving something to extinction, and so on and so forth. What we have to do is to try to undo the damage that we have done, and that has to involve 
rectifying the sin or the fault or the issue or the problem, whatever it might be, that was displayed by our conspecifics and make it the case that whatever it is that gets laid to humanity's charge, it's not this anymore. So when I ask myself, okay, so what are some possible instances of the this that we might try to undo? One thing might be something like the sin of having destroyed something unbelievably glorious. So when I think about what drives people to really, really want to bring back something like the woolly mammoth, I think surely it's that. It's the thought, here was this wonderful animal, sort of like this great big woolly mammoth striding across the tundra in its unbearably cool way. And if it was hunted to extinction, you know, we need to bring it back. It would be so cool. So it seems to me at this point that it is worth saying in order to, so if something cool has been caused to disappear and we want to bring that glorious and cool thing back, we do not successfully do that in virtue of bringing back one bedraggled woolly mammoth who's sitting you know, in some lab somewhere because we've never managed to get to a population and we don't have any kind of habitat for this woolly mammoth. And so that woolly mammoth is just sort of in a zoo, you know, sort of just sitting there doing nothing because we didn't solve the rest of the problem. Right? If, or even if we have 10 woolly mammoths sitting in that same zoo, this does not undo the problem that we, you know, I'm just pretending it's we for the sake of argument, initially created. Right? This is not a way of bringing back this glory to the world. In order to bring back the glory to the world, we have to solve all the problems. We have to, you know, we have to get the animals living, we have to get enough of them to constitute a population, we have to find a habitat for them to be in, and we have to introduce them successfully into that habitat. Secondly, we might think the problem, the thing that we need to do is the sin of having used as a mere plaything something that is worthy of reverence. Where again, I think a lot of species really deserve reverence. But again, I think that if we allow ourselves to be motivated in doing this by the thought, well, this is so cool, let's just do this in, in a way that doesn't give, it doesn't give its due to the very serious set of problems that any attempt at de-extinction would involve for the sake of the animals, then we are not undoing the sin of having treated something with disrespect something that is worthy of reverence. We are just repeating it all over again. And this, I think, would be a terrible thing to do. Just sort of to get to the one thing which is actually part of this topic, the sin of hubris. Insofar as we thought, you know, hey, you know, we can just kill all the passenger pigeons we want. That's cool. It's fine. We know what we're doing. We'll never cause that kind of serious damage. Oh, my God, what have we done? We do not in any way undo the sin of hubris by having the hubris to think, oh, hey, we can bring them back again uh, without giving due thought to what exactly we think that we're doing, right? In all of these cases, if we, if we do this the right way and we think really seriously, we restrict ourselves to those cases and those cases alone where we're, we've actually thought long and hard about every single problem, the political problems, the conservation biology problems, the animal welfare problems, and we've really worked out how to do this right. If we do it that way, we are treating the species in question with respect and we are doing our job right. If we do this in a thoughtless way, a sort of how cool would it be to bring back the Neanderthal kind of way, right? If we do that, and I am quoting an actual person when I say that, an actual person who works on these issues, who some of you may have heard say that very thing. Um, no, I know. But if we do it that way, then I think we are, we're not undoing the sins that got us into this mess. We are simply recapitulating them in a different form, and we ought to know better having done it badly the first time. So that's sort of what I have to say. Thanks.
Can everybody hear me? Am I close enough? There we go. So um, I uh, thank you to Hank and Alex for inviting me. This has been a, a really interesting day. So I have been uh, instructed with the topic of hubris and naturalness. Um, and so I thought what I would do is start with a really influential discussion of uh, Bill McKibbins from his book, The End of Nature, in which he talks about nature coming to an end explicitly with the notion of humility and pride in mind. And what I'm gonna do is uh, disagree with McKibben, hopefully in a fruitful way. And then what I wanna do is uh, more explicitly talk about nature and humility, and then the extinction and hubris. So I wanna read a passage uh, from McKibben's book. Um, he says, an idea or relationship can go extinct, just like an animal or a plant. The idea in this case is nature, the separate and wild province, the world apart from man to which he adapted under whose rules he was born and died, but quite by accident. It turned out that carbon dioxide and other gases we were producing in our pursuit of a better life could alter the power of the sun, could increase its heat, and that increase could change the patterns of moisture and dryness, breed storms in new places, breed deserts. These things may or may not have yet begun to happen, but it's too late to altogether prevent them from happening. We have produced the carbon dioxide. We are ending nature. Now, that came out in 1989. Um, the first question, when I first read this, I thought is, exactly how can we end nature? That seems like a pretty bold claim. Um, how can nature come to an end? And this passage I wanna read um, essentially articulates how that can be possible. Um, the idea of nature will not survive the new global pollution. The carbon dioxide and CFCs and the like. We have changed the atmosphere and thus we are changing the weather. By changing the weather, we make every spot on Earth man-made and artificial. We have deprived nature of its independence, and that is fatal to its meaning. Nature's independence is its meaning. Without it, there's nothing but us. Uh, the emphasis being on independence there, and meaning here, I take it, is something like significance. So um, the way I think McGibbon is articulating this notion of nature is this. Uh, nature, as opposed to artifice, is whatever has not been largely affected by human activities. And so the way in which nature can come to an end is that nature's ending because we're turning it into effectively an artifact through anthropogenic global climate change. Um, now, in a way, I actually think that climate change is not the only relevant issue here. So I'll just give you one example. So this is um, from a study done in 2005 by an ecologist, Eric Sand Sanderson, and some of his colleagues. So what they did was um, they collected a bunch of GIS data uh, with certain proxies. So this included uh, population density, land transformation, accessibility, which I take to be roughly roads, uh, and electric power. And they came up with an index which essentially maps the human footprint on the planet. Um, and what they found was is roughly about 80% of the Earth's land surface is being directly influenced by humans. And that's encoded in this map. So I don't know if you can actually see it very well. So the, on the far left, zero to one is that which is minimally influenced by humans. The black is maximally influenced. Most of uh, the planet is, the surface of the planet at least, is somewhere in the middle, right? So we don't have to go to climate change to consider whether or not we're radically changing the planet, i.e. this is just the Anthropocene. So the implication is clear, our planet's increasingly being made artificial. So then the question is, why does that matter? And so McGibbon has a very particular view as to why that matters. So he says, how are, we, how are we to be humble in any way if we've taken over as creators? Thoreau once stood in the woods watching, quote, an insect crawling amid the pine needle on the forest floor and endeavoring to conceal itself from my sight. It reminded him, he said, and Thoreau was no especially humble man, of the, quote, great benefactor, an intelligence that stands over me, the human insect. But what standard stands over us, McKibben asks. So as a philosopher, I'm interested in evaluating arguments. And so I take it that McKibben's argument here is that humans first should be humble. That's a virtue, and it's important to be virtuous. Secondly, uh, nature and our experiences of it is required for us to be humble, and so therefore we shouldn't end nature. 
So let me say a little bit more about humility um, and possibly uh, a little bit more about uh, hubris, sort of its opposite. So from, and this is me riffing on my sort of own thoughts, um, I think of humility as consisting in understanding one's proper place in the world. So a humble person doesn't underestimate themselves, nor do they overestim uh, overestimate themselves, either in terms of their knowledge, their worth, etc. Why be humble? That's a really hard philosophical question. Um, but a simple gloss, um, one that I find moderately persuasive is this. Because moderation is not impetuous, but it's also not overly cautious. You neither take excessive risks nor forego assured goods. So it's a life of balance. It's a sort of a wise life. Um, I also want to say that humility is an important environmental virtue. Uh, a variety of philosophers have articulated this. Um, so a humble person will be someone who will respect and care about the natural world. So this roughly seems to be suggested by a few facts. One, humans are encultured primates. Right? We are biological beings. Uh, we are members of the biosphere and we're dependent on the Earth's biota. And the third thing is, is that um, we're not the only species that matter. The question of why other species matter and the extent to which they matter, uh, Ron's going to talk about. But given these things, um, it strikes me as humility is really important for thinking about our environmental responsibilities. I'm not persuaded by McKibben's argument, and I think this has direct relevance to uh, issues of de-extinction. Um, and the reason why I'm not is because I don't think that wild nature is, um, that's in scare quotes, is necessary for inculcating humility. Um, that is, learning for what one's proper place in the world is. Um, so two things, humility can be developed in extremely artificial environments, and hubris can be exemplified in very natural ones. So two examples. Uh, several years ago, I was in Shanghai, and I remember turning a corner, and I saw a wall of people on bikes. And that was a humbling experience, right? I was in an incredibly urbane, artificial environment. Um, humility can be tokened in the artificial. Um, I have rock climbing friends where hubris is obviously present, right? They overestimate their abilities uh, in very clear ways, and this can be in some of the most natural, pristine places you've ever been. Humility is not intimately linked to the natural world in the way that McKibben is suggesting. Fair enough. So the Anthropocene is compatible both with humility and hubris. Right? It doesn't solve it one way or the other. Um, Additionally, um, Hillary mentioned the sort of phrase of playing God, and, and I'm similarly uh, inclined to think that the notion of playing God is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, the way I might put it is it's, a little too, it's, it's too little too late to be worrying about playing God. We've already done it, and we're going to have to continue doing it. Um, so given all that, then the question, the relevant question for me is, are some of the more radical strategies that environmentalists, ecologists, et cetera, are considering assisted migration, rewilding, and in this context, especially the extinction, are they hubristic? Are they prideful? Are they arrogant? So what I want to do is, on the one hand, ask some questions. Uh, some of these have already been echoed um, about how you might find failures of humility in the context of the extinction. Um, and then ask sort of the flip side, the positive questions. What kinds of things can we look for from an ethical, philosophical point of view to try to um, defend the extinction when appropriate? So these are the sort of things that, um, the questions I have um, for the strategy of de-extinction. So um, do we find ourselves overestimating our knowledge of the relevant consequences? So of a given species, will it be a, a GMO and whatever, uh, bad effects that uh, brings about. Are there retroviruses associated with their genome? Will they be invasive? What kinds of socio-political implications uh, are there? So the question, um, I might put it this way, is how do we operationalize vigilance? How do we make that practical? Secondly, um, we have to be careful uh, that we don't overestimate our commitment to the, vi to the viability uh, of a species. So two examples I was thinking about were the Chinese river dolphins and the oryx and the oman. Uh, Stuart Penn mentions this. If you're genuinely committed to the viability of these species, you have to be committed to something more than a certain population number, right? You have to be committed to 
there being appropriate habitat, et cetera. Um, it, I think it can be easy for us to overcommit ourselves, well, not overcommit, overestimate our commitment, where we get enough in the lab and then we leave it, right? So we have to be fundamentally committed to get these species off the ground if we're going to de-extinct them. Third, we have to be careful not to overestimate um, our concern for the suffering of individual animals. That is to say, um, to think we care more than we in fact do. So in the case of the ibex, um, you know, when I, a practical way of asking that question is how many painful 12-minute lives are worth it, right? And we, and we have to be sensitive to that fact. Um, sort of flip side of underestimation. Um, we don't want to underestimate the extinction threat of extant species, um, thus wasting precious resources. That's something that has been mentioned quite a bit. If you listen to someone like E.O. Wilson, he says, according to species area models, something like 10,000 species per year are being lost. Okay. That's a lot. Um, and so, um, as one example of a question about resources, what does the extinction do to an already limited environmental attention span? I teach a philosophy in the environment class, and I can tell you their attention span is very, very small. Third, or fourth, fifth, um, underestimate the human-caused loss of biodiversity. This is one that's been mentioned um, through the topic of sort of reparations. And one of the things I'm interested in is the question of, and I'm gonna phrase it slightly differently, um, how does the creation of a sibling species, in effect, rectify past harms? In what sense is this making good on a wrongdoing by creating a species which is phenotypically much like the past species, um, but is not exactly the same? We normally uh, articulate what species are in terms of, of interbreeding. We'll never know whether those two species can interbreed. So in a sense, whether the same species may be forever lost. Um, but does that rectify the, uh, what we've done? Um, the last one. Um, we've got to be careful not to underestimate the arbitrariness of our aesthetic preferences. Um, so the example, a running example are woolly mammoths. So whose aesthetic preferences matter and why? Um, and that's just a, a kind of appropriate question to ask in a democracy, right, about um, there are certain kind of, I mean, there are preferences I have for certain kinds of things that you may lack and vice versa. How do we make decisions about which species to bring back in light of that? So, the positive way of putting what I've said so far uh, is this, and then I'll conclude with this um, last thing. So we should engage in de-extinction only if the following things I think can be dealt with successfully. And I'm actually not opposed to de-extinction as a strategy. I think probably the way to proceed is on a case-by-case -case basis. But first, we have to carefully examine the expected consequences, sort of obvious, um, inform uh, you know, evidence judgments as a result. We have to be committed to the de-species uh, uh, viability and ecology, not just getting them up to a certain number, but rather uh, their longevity and persistence. Uh, we have to be deeply concerned about the well-being of individual organisms. Um, we don't want to waste preci precious conservation resources in a world in which um, conservation is on the wane. Um, we have to honestly assess the environmental harms we've already caused, engaging seriously with the um, the losses have been and the way to move forward. And then last, we have to thoughtfully scrutinize our aesthetic desires to bring back cool critters. Thanks very much. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> Thank you for staying to the end. Um, I'm going to pretend like it's to hear what I have to say and not for the wine that's been promised. Um, so what I'm going to uh, talk about, what I'm gonna address is uh, the question that Beth posed at the end of the first talk of the day, which is why? 
uh, why engage in de-extinction in the first place. It's been percolating under all the discussions that we've had. It's bubbled up here and there. Um, it was a focus of Hillary's talk. So um, what I'm going to do, and uh, part of this is uh, the effect of being the last speaker and having had so many people say so many interesting things that I promised I was going to say those interesting things, uh, but they've been said. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of present a framework um, for thinking about why de-extinction. Um, I'm going to try to situate a lot of things that have been said today in that framework. Um, I'm going to add my two cents in here and there, and then um, uh, and then I'm going to offer some tentative conclusions for uh, for discussion. So, as far as I can tell, there's, there's roughly four different types of considerations that people are proposing for the why of de-extinction. Um, one, which uh, Hillary talked at length and Jay mentioned, uh, is this idea of justice or making up for past harms, right? We did something uh, wrong when we caused species to go extinct, and now de-extinction is a way for making up for that. A second possible reason is not so much that we have a duty of justice or something like that, but just that species are valuable. They're valuable in all kinds of ways, and when a species goes extinct, we lose that value. Right? And so maybe with de-extinction, it's a way to recapture, recreate the value that's lost, uh, especially when we're the cause of that loss. A uh, third um, consideration that was talked about quite a lot this afternoon, uh, earlier this afternoon, was the idea of, of de-extinction as contributing to preventing future value losses by, by contributing to conservation efforts. And then the last sort of category is um, what I want to call the value of de-extinction in revised species themselves. That is the value that the process of de-extinction has and the, the products, the organisms, quite apart from these other three considerations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go talk through each of these, connect them up with some things that have been said throughout the day, um, make some comments, and then try to reach some conclusions. Starting with uh, justice. Now, um, uh, like Hillary, I have some... Uh, concerns about whether or not the case for justice uh, in, in favor of de-extinction can be made out. Um, part of my concerns um, relate to an issue that she set aside, but which I think um, can be important here, which is thinking about who is the subject or the recipient of just like, who, to whom is the justice owed? And I think the intuitive idea uh, is that it's to the species, right? It's the species that we caused to go extinct, and it's the species that we're bringing back, so the justice is to the species. But I think there's some, some difficulties with this. And, and, and one, of the, 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 one difficulty which uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about is just that if the species that's revived or the organisms that are revived aren't of the same species that went extinct, right, because they're genomically different, there's not the ancestor uh, relationships there, then maybe you, you can't work it out that way. But I think there's a deeper problem, uh, which is that species just aren't the kind of things that you can harm or wrong. And that might sound a little odd in the context of talking about this issue, so let me try to motivate that idea. Um, in order to be the kind of thing that can be harmed or wronged, you have to have a welfare. You have to have interests. You have to have a good of your own. Right. And, and harm is when those things are impaired. Um, but species, separate from the individuals that comprise them, they don't have minds. They don't have desires or aims or goals or thoughts. So they don't have psychological interest in any kind of way. They don't have a psychological welfare. You can't cause them pain. You can cause individual organisms pain. You can presumably cause passenger pigeons pain, but not the species itself. Um, now, there are kinds of organisms that don't have minds that we do think, that, think uh, still have welfares or interests. These are plants, right? And why do we think that? We think that because um, they're biological organisms that are organized towards accomplishing certain ends. Their parts and processes are there because they promote survival, reproduction, uh, maintenance, growth, and these sorts of things. But again, this is not something that species have distinct from the individual organisms that comprise them. So species don't have biological interests. They don't have psychological interests. Um, they're collections of organisms. And that means that they can't be harmed, they can't be wronged, and you can't owe a debt of justice to them. So I think there's, there's conceptual problems with making out the justice case to species. Something similar holds with respect to the idea of justice to nature. Nature doesn't have a mind, right? Ecological systems aren't themselves uh, internally goal-directed systems that can be benefit or harmed the way organisms are, so it's, it's tough to ground biological interest in nature. Now, individual organisms uh, certainly can be harmed and wronged. Um, but the problem here, which has been pointed out already, is that when you're dealing with an extinct species, all the organisms that were possibly harmed or wronged are dead. And so they're not there to be made 
up to. All right, so I don't think we can make sense of uh, justice in the context of de-extinction in a restitutive sense. That is in the idea of making it up to the entity that's been harmed or wronged. Okay. Then the question becomes, is there another sense of justice that we might appeal to in this context or we appeal to in other contexts where we don't have a subject or recipient of justice? And, I, and the answer is yes. Um, there's a conception of justice that we might call something like reparative justice. And that's when harms or wrongs have been done, but then there's no clear per person or entity to whom we owe, uh, we can make it up to. The one that was wronged or harmed isn't there. Um, now what's involved in reparative justice is something very different than what's involved in restitutive justice. In reparative justice, the idea is that what you wanna try to do is you wanna try to prevent the harm or wrong that occurred from causing further harms or wrongs in the future. And you also wanna to try to um, reform ourselves and our institutions so that we don't commit the same kinds of harms or wrongs in the future, kind of rehabilitative conception of justice. So what would this mean in the context of anthropogen anthropogenic species extinctions? Like what would be reparative justice in those cases? What would mean mitigating the impact of species extinctions on ecological systems in the future, right? So make sure that those extinctions we've caused, we, we sort of minimize the damage going forward, and then changing our practices and institutions so we cause fewer extinctions in the future. That would be reparative justice in this case. So then we ask the question, uh, what role would de-extinction have in that? And this is a question I think that a lot of people have spoken to uh, over the course of the day. Um, and that Hillary spoke quite a lot about uh, just a few minutes ago, which is that um, de-extinction would have a really limited role here. Right? The only kinds of de-extinctions that would play a role in mitigating future um, impacts of past extinctions would be de-extinctions where we bring the species back, we reintroduce it, and it's ecologically beneficial to the system. Right? And those are gonna be fairly rare cases for a lot of reasons that have been discussed, I think. Uh, and then the other consideration that's relevant here is the possible disincentive for reform that de-extinction poses, right? If we can bring back species, um, then maybe we don't have to worry so much about them going extinct and we're not gonna reform our practices and our institutions that are causing the extinctions quite as aggressively. Um, that, that's come up, that came up in Jamie's talk and Kate's talk and uh, many others. Okay, so I think that the, the sort of justice argument or justice considerations in favor of de-extinction are, are not particularly strong. There's some there, there's a little bit there, but not, not very much. Uh, that brings me to the second uh, consideration, recreating lost value, right? The idea here is that even if we don't owe justice to species, species have value, and species have lots of different types of value. Species have ecological value, they're valuable, uh, they, it, it, the, 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 um, uh, they play ecological roles in the systems of which they're part, they're instrumentally valuable to other species and to us, everything from recreation to natural resources to economic value and so on. Uh, they play a role in our cultural practices and um, our aesthetics. And many people think that species have intrinsic value, that is value in and of themselves quite apart from their usefulness to other things, typically in virtue of their being sort of distinctive forms of life that are the product of uh, historical evolutionary processes. So species have value. We cause a species to go extinct, we extinguish the value, right? So maybe de-extinction could be justified on the grounds that it's gonna recreate this value that we've wrongfully extinguished from the world. I think this gets also at some of the things Hillary was suggesting. Here's the difficulty um, with this line of argument, though. And it comes to the fore when you think about um, what you get from a de-extinction, right? What you get is you get organisms that have high levels of genetic similarity to other organisms that haven't been in existence for some time. Um, but then when you put that against the kinds of values that species have, um, you see that the value that they have isn't just about their genetics. In all of these cases, ecological, instrumental, cultural, intrinsic, um, the relational properties of species are crucial to their value. It's, it's how they relate to other parts of the ecosystem. It's um, what's their instrumental relationship to our practices, right? It's um, what's their role in our culture and their, whether or not they develop by human independent processes in the case of intrinsic value. And to see this, just think about um, polar bears roaming the Arctic, right? That's valuable compared to polar bears in the Central Park Zoo. Less valuable, right? Passenger pigeons in the lab compared to passenger pigeons in mass migration or, or being a, a plentiful and expensive source of protein. So because the basis for the value is relationships and de-extinction doesn't reestablish the relationships, there's this interesting feature, which is that it might be that de-extinction revives the organisms without reviving the value that the organisms had. 
that I think is something interesting to think about at any rate. There will be exceptions. Um, again, cases where recently de-extinct, um, recently extinct or, uh, species would be reintroduced and the ecological relationships are still there, then you might get some of that ecological value back. Okay, so, um, so there is a little bit here, but very, uh, again, these are gonna be rare cases uh, for reasons that have been discussed. So there's some justification for de-extinction and recreating value, but not nearly as much as it might have initially appeared. Preventing future species losses. So the idea here, right, is that de-extinction can play a role in addressing our conservation challenges. All right, so what should we make of this? Um, I'm a philosopher. I'm gonna defer mostly to the people who spoke in the previous session. Um, but here is what I sort of take away from them. Uh, I think it's clear um, that the techniques involved in de-extinction, cloning, um, other, other techniques, uh, synthetic biology, might have conservation applications, right? Cloning might be useful in a captive breeding program, for example. So definitely the tools and techniques involved could have um, conservation value. But when you think about de-extinction as a conservation strategy, it has severe limitations. Uh, first of all, it doesn't really prevent the extinction, though I'm now gonna have to rethink this uh, since, or, or how are they were described as, um, highly endangered species, right? They're, they're, if they're really just endangered species, then maybe they do pre prevent a, a, an extinction. But um, in regular thinking, right, de-extinction doesn't prevent extinction. Still less does it address the causes of extinction. It doesn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It doesn't reduce pollution. It doesn't reduce extraction. It doesn't protect, it doesn't protect habitat. For reasons I just discussed, it doesn't necessarily preserve the value of species. Um, it's fine grain that is it's focused on individual species rather than capturing very large numbers of species. And when you're looking at the enormous conservation challenges that we have, especially in light of con climate change, what you really want is something that can capture a lot of species. So it doesn't seem to scale very well. And uh, speculatively, it may be comparatively expensive. So when you look at all of these and you think about what would an ideal conservation strategy be, right? Well, it would prevent extinctions. It would do it by addressing the cause. Uh, it would preserve the value of the species, it would capture large amounts of species, and it would be cost effective. And it, the worry is that none of these are going to apply um, very well to the extinction. Uh, another sort of point that's relevant here is, is something which has been talked about a lot in the last session, uh, the idea that the backup plan or last resort or insurance policy arguments could um, be a disincentive to conservation practices, and if that were to occur, um, uh, that would further undermine this sort of justification for pursuing de-extinction. I do wanna, I do wanna say one thing about this, uh, which is kind of an aside, but I think it's worth talking about. You know, I, I do think we wanna be careful with how we wield the inevitability argument here, uh, with the fact that people are working on this, this is going to happen, right? There's, it may be true that the science and technology are gonna advance in ways that these are going to be used in some ways, but it really matters how they're used and how they're developed, right? It was inevitable once we reached a certain technological capacity that we were gonna to try to put things into space. But it really mattered the decisions we made about how and why we were gonna do that, right? That it was a civilian scientific operation rather than say a military operation, okay? So we could pursue um, the, the techniques and the technologies and the strategies involved in the extinction uh, in ways that don't necessarily involve um, looking at them as ways to bring back long extinct species. So I just want to put that out there and, and uh, maybe for comments later. All right, what about de-extinction itself? So, so far I've been sort of down on the, the arguments in favor of de-extinction. Here is where I think the money is for de-extinction. The value of de-extinction and the products of de-extinction. It's wondrous, it's amazing. It is unbelievable that we are even in the position where we're contemplating whether or not to do this or how to go forward. I, it's really astounding. And seeing an ivory-billed woodpecker, I mean, I'd go to Arkansas for that, right? I, that would be amazing. So, um, so wonderousness is there. Uh, also, there's cultural value, right? Um, some of these species are going to be valued by uh, by different societies, different cultures, different peoples, maybe even in ways they weren't before, and I think this is true of the thylacine and maybe even of the passenger pigeon. Um, symbolic value as symbols of technological achievement, as human ingenuity, is also cultural value. 
Scientific value, certainly there's going to be a lot of knowledge learned and gained in the process of developing the extinction um, and also from studying the resulting animals. Technological value, right, these tools and techniques um, are certainly going to have applications beyond the extinction. And um, as was discussed earlier today in the, in the um, uh, intellectual property talk, um, a lot of economic value, right, um, tourism, um, uh, ownership and so on. Okay, so there's a lot of potential value to de-extinction itself, separate from the conservation, separate from the justice arguments and so on. All right, so given all of that, uh, those considerations, uh, here are a few final thoughts that I offer, not as conclusions, but as points uh, for discussion. First, uh, I haven't argued that there's anything wrong with the extinction. Nothing I've said is about that. But I have sort of suggested that many of the considerations offered in support of it are not as strong as they initially appear. And in particular, the kinds of considerations that would justify an obligation to pursue it are problematic. Those are the justice, appeal to justice, and the appeal to recreating lost value, I think, would be the kinds of things you'd need to get the obligation going. And this is important. Uh, it's important that de-extinction is elective and not obligatory, um, because it has implications for prioritization and funding and the acceptability of the costs and risks. So the animal welfare considerations, the um, political ramifications, the ecological risks that we would take on to develop this might be significantly less than we would if the considerations in its favor were much stronger. Um, from a conservation perspective, de-extinction seems rather peripheral. Um, when you think about the enormous conservation challenges we face and the role that de-extinction may have in addressing it, it may have some role, but not a very large one. From a techno-science perspective, de-extinction is awesome. Um, but this has this interesting feature, that in the end, the justif justification for de-extinction is really very human-oriented. <clears throat> It's not about justice to species, that doesn't really hold up very well. It's not about the welfare of the organisms that we cause to go extinct or that we're creating. It's not about nature very much. It's really about um, this amazing thing that we are able to do and some species that we really want to see back. And I think that's important to, um, to bring to the fore. Thank you. Well, the thing before all three of the last uh, panel speakers. We have some time for questions for them before we go into our final plenary discussion. Lou Jay, Lou Hillary. Lou Rod. Um, Creighton's the Blue Jay. Oh no, Hopkins. You guys look like you sort of color coordinated. We didn't talk about what we were going to say, but what we were going to wear beforehand. Yeah, the philosophers can be counted on to know what Fashion the plates well, all of us. <laughs> As if I have any standing to talk about that. Professor Farber. Uh, um, well, I hope this isn't too tangential. Uh, but it does strike me as a question that might benefit from philosophical insight. I'm, I'm a little troubled by the term de-extinction. Um, and given the realities that we've heard about, uh, how it's actually done. Uh, and I, th I think there's a question about whether what we're creating are authentic passenger pigeons or um, imitation passenger pigeons. That is, it, which seems to me uh, might make a difference to how we feel about the enterprise. Uh, there was a f debate, I don't know, 40 years ago, a little before I was um, in the academic world uh, about a proposal to install a lot of re very realistic looking plastic trees uh, in Los Angeles because uh, it, the air pollution was bad enough at that time, it was, life was hard for the real trees. Um, and uh, the question was raised if we could do this successfully enough, if there were enough like real trees, would that be satisfactory? Um, and it does seem to me that part of the appeal here is the authenticity. For example, if we really used synthetic biology and just started from scratch and just designed something that would look just like a passenger pigeon and would fly in big flocks and would as much as possible replicate what we know about passenger pigeons, I don't know that anyone would call that de-extinction, right? So 
I'm wondering if, A, it's relevant whether we consider that to, to whatever extent there is a moral or a case for de-extinction, should we consider authenticity relevant? And if it is, uh, how would we judge um, whether we had an authentic, whether a passenger pigeon was good enough to, to satisfy our desire to really bring back the passenger pigeon? Any of you all have any? So the, those looks suggest that maybe this question was too no, tangential, no, but I, I'd appreciate the comments. It's, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a relevant question to some, the way some of the arguments play out. For, for example, the justice argument, right? So one question you might say is, uh, is this even the same species, right? So can it be justice of the same species? And then um, what I think is more important is, is in thinking about why we value these things, right? So w what is it that makes it valuable, this thing that we have created, and I think we want to get a really good handle on what it is. And what I was trying to suggest in the talk is that in a lot of cases, um, it's the relationships, right, as well as, so, so um, from my view, I think it's a little bit less important about getting the genetics just right, so that it's identically, you know, as much a resurrection or a replica, I don't know what the right term is, scare, scare quotes around everything. Um, as whether or not the kinds of relational properties that make species valuable in the first place are going to be reestablished as well. I think maybe one of the, a useful analogy here is actually uh, coming from art, and this has influenced discussions of restoration ecology. So um, if you want to restore something, you want to make, make sure there's an authenticity to it. Um, so in the case of art, uh, a forgery is not nearly as valuable as an original, and it has to do with the nature of the process which led to it. You know, did Picasso really paint it or not? Um, and in the case of uh, the extinction, the question would be, is the species in front of us authentically related to that species in the past? If not, you might have something like a forgery. Um, I use the term sibling species in a way to mark that it's phenotypically very much like it. I mean, if all you want is something very similar, then you might just selectively breed a species to look like what you want. So I think the issue of uh, authenticity matters not only for issues of justice, et cetera, but for the aesthetic considerations as well. Though I think, so I think if, if the justice argument were the central argument in favor of this, then I think that lack of authenticity would just be decisive. I mean, in the same way that you know, if, if, if I stole your wallet, and you know, you came and said, "No, you must give it back." And I found somebody who looked a lot like you and gave your wallet to that person. That would not be okay. Right? <laughs> but in the case, when I think about some of the relational problems, I mean, insofar as relational problems are things like playing a particular ecological role to other existing species, if you get that right enough, you know, then you've got some of the relational problems solved. So if what you want is a, you know, a large herbivore to break up your tundra, right? then backbreeding seems to me to be a really great way to do that. And your, the problem with authenticity is not gonna, not gonna loom nearly as large, I think. Though you'll probably be more confident. Um, this is, I'm, I'm just gonna make a purely tangential remark after a bit about McKibben. But you're, you'll be more confident that you've actually got it right and that there's not going to be any kind of horrible unintended consequences if it is actually authentic, I think. So this is about McKibben. Man, I think that the, I mean, I think that humility would be, in my case, caused directly by my assuming the role of creator, right? Insofar as if I were to assume the role of creator of nature, I would fail, right? And for that reason, actually, that it would cause me to have an accurate and very low estimate of my ability to do this. And the reason that actual nature causes me to realize my own limitations is that it's good. I'm not, right? If I were creating something from scratch, I would screw it up. Anyways. So I want to push on the authenticity point for a bit. Authenticity has bothered me personally in my reaction to things for a long time. I don't know why I should care more about the Mona Lisa behind its glass and its bulletproof glass where you can hardly see it through the crowds as opposed to a perfect copy that I can examine at leisure, but it's not the same and, and it bothers me. I, I'm not quite comfortable with why I feel that way. 
But two thoughts on that. First, I um, was vacationing in Germany last year, including in cities that were completely leveled by bombs from one side or the other, or both. And the Germans reconstructed much of those cities. Uh, they had, excellent, not surprisingly, they had excellent plans of everything that they'd ever <laughs> built and were able to reconstruct them in great detail. And I wasn't looking at the actual church spire in Munster where they had hung the Anabaptists to die in 1500. And those cages weren't the original actual cages, but they were chilling anyway. Um, they were moving and powerful anyway. And maybe that's in part because they were at least in the same place as well as being replicas. But the, you know, the authenticity is, is tricky, I think. The other thing I'd like to really push back on on authenticity, though, is about species. I mean, yes, a revived passenger pigeon wouldn't be exactly the same as any of the passenger pigeons whose genomes had been sequenced, but none of you three folks on the panel have exactly the same genomes. And the cells in your left hand don't have exactly the same genomes as the cells in your right hands, and yet I'm willing to grant that you're all part of the same species along with the rest of us in this room. At least the 10% the of you that are human cells as opposed to the 90% of you that are bacterial cells. Um, of each of us. I'm a Neanderthal. <laughs> well, we are probably all about 2 to 3%. Most of us are 2 to 3% Neanderthal. But so I do think the species definition itself, the definition of species is a long and, and difficult problem. In a sense, um, Talking about the authenticity of the revived passenger pigeon versus the actual extinct passenger pigeon may reify some of the uh, less subtle aspects of defining what a species is. Uh, just so very quickly on that, I think that you know the fact that there's a pluralistic amount of species concepts, some of which on, on some of which uh, the the organism would be of the same species, on some it wouldn't. Right. So, and I don't think that there's any one right or wrong species concept. So as a descriptive matter, I don't think it's going to settle the issue. We just have different species concepts and it's going to shake out different ways on different, on different concepts. So the real question in my mind is uh, the value question. You know, why is it value? And, and, and maybe that's not, you know, we don't want to base that on the, the species concept question because there's just a lot of legitimate species concepts. But I do think the value question ultimately is connected to the authenticity question. Because what would make it so, what would fill it with wondrousness, which the word you put up there, I'm not sure it's a word, but I like it. Uh, what would fill us with wonder from it, in part, is our perception that it's not this newly artificially made, man-made thing, but that it is a woolly mammoth, or it is an ivory-billed woodpecker, or so on. At least, to some significant extent, for many of us. And for many of us, the fact that it is man-made will add to its wonder, wondrousness. I wanted to ask about a theme in both um, Hillary and um, Jay's talks, which is about this question of um, responsibility for past extinctions. And then I want to connect it up with the question about the viability of species that were de-extincted, as it were. So I, what I was wondering about was once, um, once humans have become sufficiently um, capable, it seems like it seems really possible to think that there's responsibility in some sense, both for what humans um, sort of actively bring about and for what humans per permit. So I'm not sure, I guess, how much we should care about causal responsibility in general as opposed to some sort of um, moral responsibility. And then once we get into moral responsibility, I start to wonder whether um, we should be wondering about extinctions that we caused as opposed to extinctions that we wrongfully caused. That is, it seems like the idea of responsibility is going to get moralized in some way, which then makes me wonder about even some cases in the past where species were hunted to extinction, it might be that not all the caused extinctions were wrongful and not all the permitted extinctions were were rightful, so that the right wrong line doesn't end up tracking exactly with the causal line. And I guess related to that, especially in Jay's talk, I was wondering if you could say more about what the argument is for why we need to care about um, the long-term viability of the species, and in particular, are we supposed to understand that viability is independent in some way of human choices? Because if we understand it that way, that seems like we're 
bringing somebody like McKibben's view back in in a way that I think you convincingly argued against. It seems like a lot of species that are around now are around at our sufferance in a way, even though it might make a difference where they're around and whether we can have them around um, within, say, a enclosed environment or like a zoo versus in something that was um, more unenclosed. But that doesn't seem to be this line between it doesn't seem like there's the same notion of independence once you have a species like humans with agency and a certain kind of power on the scene. Uh, both are very good questions. So um, let me take that last one first, because I think I can address that uh, more quickly. I, the issue about um, long-term viability is really a practical one. I mean, I think we would prefer to have species that we didn't have to continually manage, continually manage uh, than uh, ones that, you know, we'd rather have them be able to survive on their own without heavy management just for practical reasons. Um, so I wasn't trying to make a, a strong moral point there. Um, with regard to the sort of roughly, I'll put it in terms of doing and allowing, um, one of the things I've been sort of interested in with regard to de-extinction is if the technique opens up the possibility of bringing back a variety of species, not all for the obvious practical reasons, but within a certain window of 10,000 years, say, why only consider, consider the ones that we uh, caused to go extinct, but think about ones that we could bring back that we had no part in their extinction? So I was thinking, of, so Alex earlier today was talking about the importance of ecological function. So you might imagine that there are slots in food webs which we could place species which would continue functions that might otherwise dis dis disappear. It seems to me that that's a live question, not because the, what's relevant morally is not just what we did, but there are opportunities that we can now enact. So I'm not saying we should, but I think that's an important question. The, the extinction opens up that entire terrain. I should say, um, having worked to some extent on moral responsibility, I think that I am, I think that I can take moral responsibility. I have moral responsibility for what I did. I can take moral responsibility for something that some member of a group that I'm a part of did. I don't know to what extent it makes sense to hold myself responsible for what humanity as a whole did. I agree with you that it would be good if I were to do that, to restrict myself to the cases where humanity did something wrongfully. But I think especially given the alternative in this case of trying to prevent humanity from doing things that are much easier to prevent than to, than to undo once you've already done them, that humanity is in the middle of doing, I would think that if I were inclined to assume responsibility for what humanity as a whole did, this would still not be at the top of my list in terms of responsibility in that sense. Though whatever other arguments there may be for doing this are left untouched by that point. Just a really quick follow up for Jay. Um, this, um, there's a bunch of species around now though, right, that require pretty intensive management by humans in order to, like a lot of um, crop species that require, or. Um, uh, some food animals. So I guess I'm wondering if is, is there some reason with respect to these species why it's especially important that they be require less frequent intervention on our part or something like that? No, I mean as I say, yeah, I really do take that as a practical point. It's it's me being sort of lazy. I would prefer for me not to have to do more work than less. Well, I mean one reason is that with respect to de-extinction, the whole point is to keep them around. It's not obvious off the top of my head that there is a value to having you know, a particular strain of corn continue in, in existence, especially one that's human caused. Well, sorry, you, you would need to convince me of that. And so therefore, it's, it's certainly not because of the problem of it's going extinct that we go on raising it. I don't know. So, uh, you know, one of the things I find sort of thrilling about de-extinction is it, it's a way to sort of pick at this hard knot of agency and nature and responsibility. It's really been kind of at the center of environmental ethics and politics. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very hard thing to, to get a, a hold on, because anytime you follow one of the threads, you get wrapped up in another thing you don't really like. And, that, and, the, and the way that we've... Um, use concepts of nature and agency and responsibility sometimes on harm. So, you know, harm to native peoples who've been kicked off land that they lived in for a long time in order to do conser conservation projects. Um, you know, these sorts of ways in which, you know, claiming to do something for the good of the world has all these 
side effects because we haven't really paid attention to the way that we're all, all these concepts are wrapped up together. And I think the extinction kind of pulls them apart a little bit. Um, um, but I'm, I'm worried that sometimes we're gonna reify it when we, when we really focus, when we make our value judgments based on ideas like man-made or, um, or uh, synthetic or artificial, that we're just going to, to replicate some of those, those long-standing problems. I mean, it, the passenger pigeon, it, it, even if it's restored, is still not man-made. It's still not artificial. It's still not entirely an artifact of, of human activity. Um, yes, it is in some ways miraculous, and it's, it comes out of impressive um, advances in science done by very smart people um, who you know, are very skilled uh, at doing impressive things, but it's still, uh, it's still mostly something that comes from the creativity and resilience and vibrancy of evolution. Um, and and, and I, I really would hope that when we think through our criteria for engaging in de-extinction, we think very carefully about um, you know, uh, nurturance and caring in a very sort of specific way that doesn't rely on these sort of hardened concepts of what is man-made, what is natural, who is responsible for what, but instead look to cultivating um, uh, in a careful, nurturing kind of way. Uh, I, I don't think we really have the vocabulary for it in environmental ethics yet, or bioethics. Um, um, but I really hope we can kind of move past the sort of double backflip humility that McKibben wants to do where we're so humble in the face of nature that, we've, that we think we, it's us that have done everything bad, it's us that, that has um, destroyed everything, um, and that nature can't take care of itself sometimes. Um, I, there's, uh, there's something to be said about loosening these things up and finding a, a new way of thinking through the relationship between nature responsibility and agency. I guess I kind of lost a question there, but uh, um, I'm wondering if you, you could sort of think through with me, like what, what does humility look like when we're sticking our hands that much deeper into nature and no longer saying responsibility is only keeping out? What is responsibility when we're really intentfully getting in there, um, but yet still acknowledging that resiliency and independence? Of nature, I know it's it's a hard problem. I'll go. Sure. Um, so I, I mean, one part I agree completely with is the idea that the dichotomous conception of nature, where there's nature and there's artifact, and there's some strong value orientation that cuts right along those lines, um, probably was never useful and is definitely no longer useful um, for doing environmental ethics or bioethics or anything like that. We have so many techno-nature yeah. creations. There's so much falls in the middle, it's just not, it's not gonna be helpful. Um, so I think, uh, I think that's uh, one point. Um, I think uh, there's an interesting question here about valuing the, the processes that give rise to these things and honoring them, even while we recognize that in order to try to conserve or preserve them, we have to be a lot more interventionist. Yeah. And this is to what I think Alex was mentioning earlier today. There is another option, right? And the other option is just to say, you know what? These processes that gave rise to all these wonderful organisms and these, and these wonderful systems and relationships um, that we're working that did this, right, that we've disrupted and done in all kinds of ways, um, they're gonna still operate. And we could, instead of becoming more interventionist and trying to do these things, we could just, we could, not suggest that this, um, this is just an option. Uh, we could step back and say, you know what? Let's give them space for these human independent processes which we so value and which um, have produced these valuable things in the past to do their work and, and let them go. Now, part of the problem is that we don't like that timeline. Yeah. Um, but, um, but that would be a way of honoring this that would be different from the very interventionist way. And so I think a lot of really interesting discussions in ecosystem management right now, more generally, not just de-extinction, is about that, right? And, uh, and it's, I think something that's gonna just have to, we're gonna have to work that out both in theory and on the ground. 
I think that conceptually it has never been a good, uh, the, the distinction between the human and, and the natural has never been a good one sort of operating in, in any direction you choose. It is not the case that what we deliberately on purpose do is not natural. It is not the case that what we stay out of you know, is natural. None of that is true. But I think what we need to do is to find, well, is not to try to think, you know, oh, well, we just have to not let, not do anything, and then sort of nature will happen, as though we were not natural ourselves. What we need to do is find some way of not doing things that are disastrous. And I think we've been actually really bad at that. And the more we recognize that, I, I would think, the more humble it ought to make us, and the more it ought to make us think, you know, on the one hand, we cannot afford to indulge to what are, to my mind, delusions like the fact that you know, we can just sort of step back any time and then it'll all just be nature again. Um, but on the other hand, we do have to recognize that we have a rather considerable track record of catastrophe and take on board whatever lessons we can glean from that and try to use them as wisely as possible and what that would involve, I have no clue. A quick uh, analogy here. Uh, Suppose, suppose contrary to all the scientific facts that uh, climate change right now is actually caused by, you know, um, uh, volcanoes and, and solar activity and so on. If we nevertheless could prevent the worst effects, if they were the same as they would be if it was human caused, it wouldn't matter to us whether it was human caused in a certain sort of way. We'd still want to prevent, as Hillary says, the dangerous outcomes. Right, and so I think tracking what we do, what, what nature does, like both have said, is misplaced. I agree. Alex is reminding me that we need to move on, but, and Alex won't be surprised, oh, but there are more people who want to ask questions. Um, but I was gonna say something anyway, even before that. One, ask one model, I'm not pushing this as the right model, but one model for a relationship where you're intimately involved with guiding and forming and shaping something which you think has some independent value and needs to have some independence from you, is parenting. Whether we are capable of putting in the effort and commitment to parent nature, let alone wise enough to do it, is another question, but as a father of two children myself, you did it whether you were wise enough to do it or not. You do the best you can. We don't want to be abusive. <laughs> <laughs> Rebellion. So my question kind of veers away <clears throat> from authenticity and goes to what you were talking about a lot with value. Um, and instead of bringing de-extinction back in terms of bringing a whole species back, what if we, I want to know the ethics and ideas behind bringing back value that might have been lost. I'm gonna use two examples to make this clear. Um, in like prehistoric Earth, the very, very first living organisms would have had, had to live in chemical conditions that weren't, aren't the same as today, sort of a thing. But if we were to like start inhabiting other places in the universe, we may re-encounter those sort of conditions. Of course, inhabiting, inhabiting other areas of the universe has its own ethics, but like, let's say that we find an area on Earth that we want to research. What would be the ethics of bringing back genes that no longer exist so that our bacteria could live in those conditions? Another example that I want to use is the cassowary um, lives right now, but it's endangered. And there are many, at least 40 plant species that rely on the existence of this bird because it eats the seeds and then the seeds go through their life cycle through the bird. But if this bird goes extinct, then all of these plants will as well, unless we then de-extinct its traits and then maybe put it into a living mammal that would then eat these plants continue the life cycle of the plants so that the plants can continue to survive without the bird. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Uh, it seems that the better strategy is trying to conserve the cassowary. And it's also awesome. 
So there's two reasons to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so the, and that, that's, I think that's a good example, right? Where you would try, you say, all right, well, let's see about replicating these ecosystem functions, but by far the easier way is just to try to conserve the, the cassowary, which would be by doing things that would prevent the things that are causing this extinction. Right? So now, the, first the, case? the first case I didn't quite track. So the first case, we want to do something, we want to, we want to put genes into something for research purposes. Right. We already like bring back genes that no longer exist. Sure. N not that they have never existed, but that they well, once existed. Maybe, maybe, one, maybe one question to ask would be, why does it matter that they're genes or that they're in a living organism? Because one solution that you might do for the cassowary would be to have robots with sort of acid-filled things that suck up the seeds and sort of digest them and then excrete them at various sort of strategic locations and just sort of roam around, you know, with solar power on their back doing this, right? I'm not sure that there would be, you know, that if you're just talking about bringing back a capacity as opposed to an organism, it would make any difference at all whether this is part of an organism. In the case of, you know, our somehow being able to live in strange environments, it's not clear what the advantage of bacteria other than convenience would be over things like, in the case of cold environments, really, really, really big parkas or specially, you know, specially enclosed bathysphere-like environments or God knows what. And I think, the danger of organisms would be they get out, they start modifying things, they have unintended consequences. But as far as I can tell, when you're not talking about actual organisms that have actual interests, it really would be a straight cost-benefit analysis. Is it better to have bacteria with you that might get out, but on the other hand would not require an entire bathysphere? You know, is it better to have a bathysphere that you know wouldn't risk replicating itself all over a planet and destroying it, but on the other hand is so bulky? Well, thank you three. We are now convening the plenary session. I'll ask all the speakers to come forward, bring some extra chairs, because we don't have enough. And we'll talk for a while, and the wine comes after the plenary session. You guys get to stay up here, lucky devil. And let's grab some chairs. Okay. I'm still going out. All right, well the speakers don't quite outnumber the audience, yeah. <laughs> although I have been in panels where that was true. Um, have everybody, Andrew, come on down. Stuart, come on down. <laughs> Four, five, ten. Where's Beth? There's Beth. You're up here, Beth. Ah, okay. Anywhere, up front. So we'll let the audience get at him soon. Uh, but I just got one question, and anybody can go after it to whatever extent they want or don't want. What today have you heard that most surprised, interested you, changed your perspective, et cetera? Anybody want to take that? Well, Nothing changed anyone's perspective. Nobody wants to answer my silly bad question. I don't know about surprise, but I think something Jake mentioned earlier underscored for me a pivot moment. So, at least in my view, and Alex or Jamie may see it different, you know, wildlife law at a state level hinges on ownership by the state holding the property in trust for the greater good. And our laws would apply if that's the ownership structure we're under. But Jake talked a lot about private possessory interest and in intellectual property. And if you make that pivot around property, I wonder if you end up with wildlife and regulation through our laws. 
Well, I definitely, I mean, it's rela a related sort of a reflection on that is, is simply that I think depending on what frame you address questions like ownership or public trust, that kind of, the, the sorts of public ownership versus private ownership obviously goes a long way in determining what, who gets to control decisions like this. I, I do think, I mean, if you come at it from what I understand the Endangered Species Act frame to come at it with, um, and I will I probably would take issue with Jamie's uh, sort of suggestion that the ESA has no role in this simply because I don't know if you can prevent it from having a role in it. Um, but I think if you come at it from that frame, and the frame there is that all sorts of activities regarding rare species are supposed to be for conservation purposes. Uh, if you have any of the other sorts of reasons that Jake was suggesting might be reasons for attaching ownership to it, like consumption or recreation or, or commerce, uh, those are in conflict. What, what we embody in the Endangered Species Act are what we should be doing with regard to those sorts of species. So certainly the frame, and the frame there is that there's a public interest in, in those, those species and those organisms that are in direct conflict with what the patent regime might suggest. Although one thing that might reconcile both that comment and Jamie's is to say that under the statute, is to interpret the statute under the Endangered Species Act to say these are not endangered species. And I was blown away, I forget now whose comment it was, I think it was yours, about the range. You know, the endangered species is tied, at least in part, to a range. What is the range of a laboratory-created passenger pigeon? So, I mean, and I, 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 I mean, now I can attack Jamie. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I, I, I no, no, exactly. No, I mean, I, I think the concern I have is it's more of a practical one to say, like, let's keep the ESA out of it. I, I think, in fact, it's quite it, almost impossible to, if you believe that introduction is the end goal, because at some point it will interact with other species uh, systems, and inevitably the, it will be implicated, and you will have to be making a sort of normative decision as to what this landscape should look like. I mean, like. I think that part's certainly right, even if one were to interpret the act as to not apply right. to, to the de-extincted species. It would certainly apply to the endangered species with whom they might ultimately interact. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, j just to be, so I, now I can debate law without my license. Um, um, I, I absolutely agree with Alex's take. When I was suggesting my kind of aha moment um, in so much of this conversation to date that I've heard tangentially has been that kind of almost nesting within the Endangered Species Act. Mm -hmm. And I think the Endangered Species Act comes into play only at the introduction stage. Because I don't think that whatever we're de-extincting will meet the definition of species as it's been applied through case law and interpretation for the last 40 years. I don't believe it's a distinct population segment. I don't believe it's threatened or endangered or highly endangered and we're gonna think up a new term. <coughs> it, it comes like like when we reintroduce anything, um, the impacts and the frame of law come into play with reintroduction um, more, more so than, than not. Although you do need a federal permit to keep them as a captive breeding population, right? Well, no, again, no, not if it's not an endangered species. So, so, so well, I don't know, but, but what is it? I mean, look at the purposes of the law and look at the goals of the law. It, it is to prevent the extinction and to provide for the protection of the ecosystems on what they depend. So what is the permit for? It might be under other laws that we talked about earlier. Uh, the permit will come or um, when you have to go through some kind of consultation on the impacts of reintroducing this thing into the wild and what kind of potential collision will occur with currently listed species. But if it's not a listable entity, then I think the frame of law doesn't maybe protect it. I'm, I, I can debate myself on this, yeah. but, but I think what's interesting is what I heard today is um, we shouldn't, uh, just decide that it's a listable entity when it doesn't exist today to begin with. So Andrew wants in and then uh, Stuart. I'm happy to let Stuart go first. That's humility. <laughs> Not a lot of scientists here, so I didn't hear any science news, but the political angles turned up something interesting to me, which is sort of thinking on, on Chuck's perspective on, you know, let's get something going in California for good political thinking ahead reasons. And so, okay, what are some candidates in, that used to live in California? And 
Well, there's a stellar sea cow. Boy, that's a really difficult animal. That's going to be a later one. A five-ton animal will live out here in the kelp forest. Uh, there is another mammoth, the Colombian mammoth, that was here. There's some of their bones in the tar pits. But another animal that people really are interested in is very present in the tar pits is the saber-toothed cat, which I'd always sort of ruled out in my mind because don't bring them. You know, they, they, they'd be sinking their great big fangs into my soft little body. But <laughs> Jamie makes a case for predators, you know, get that trophic level uh, operating again. So, and we should bring something back to California. So I'm going out here thinking, somebody says, let's do the saber-toothed cat. We'll do it at the zoo level for a while. Uh, it would be a big deal in the zoos. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> don't go, don't go. <laughs> Fence technology has come a long way. And you know that there are going to be, there already are starting to be fence reserves of animals that include, you know, it's not the short-faced bear yet, but uh, we're getting in that direction. And we are trying to bring more predators uh, back into present. So the wolf is being quietly welcomed back into California. It hasn't been here in 100 years, as Chuck pointed out. So I go away thinking that the saber-toothed cat is not as far off the candidate list as I thought. So I know that uh, the microphone. Go ahead. But <laughs> you'll talk about. <laughs> uh, since perhaps we're being blogged about, and for posterity's sake, you know, I'm not suggesting that California is ready uh, to design the regulatory scheme and go here. What I am saying is, if some of the community is going to take us there. It's far better now to start the conversation about how you might do with this, rather than arrive upon the moment you want to release and realize you're facing a deluge of additional permits and approval, which may take you a decade or 15 more years uh, and never be survivable because we haven't sorted out the issues. Um, now, your comment, Stuart, about predators goes directly to Jamie's comment about social tolerance. I told you in the break, uh, we shot the last wolf in California about 100 years ago. One month after I came on the job, we got our first wolf back in California in 100 years, walked over from Oregon. And in his roaming, ironically, got very close to where the last one was shot. Um, and one animal, causes a good portion of California to ask me to make Modoc County a wolf preserve, and another portion of California to say, let's get it out of here, and take it back where it came from. We're not ready, societally. And, you know, I'll just read to you what the, Forest, the Fish and Wildlife Service said in its grizzly bear recovery plan in the Intermountain West in 82. Quote, this is an animal that cannot compromise or adjust its way of life to ours could not by its very nature, could not even if we allowed it the opportunity, which we did not. For the grizzly bear, there is no freedom but that of unbounded space, no life except its own. I would just say, how in the world do you expect today the saber tooth would fare any better than those remarks about the grizzly bear in the Intermountain West? So my, my contribution has nothing to do with this particular strand. I hope you'll not mind a departure. Um, Three things that I think struck me very, very hard today. One is, I think biodiversity law may not actually be really part of environmental law in the way that we think that it is. I think that it might be not just different in, in, in certain ways, it might be different in kind. I, I've been teaching it since, um, I'm trying to think, since 1998. And I, I've always thought about it as a distinct field of environmental law, maybe even a distinct area of law, I'm more convinced today that it is, in part because it implicates um, complexities that I think a lot of the other aspects of environmental law don't. I, I, maybe it's not that, maybe it's that biodiversity law has sort of um, diverged from environmental law and, and brought along with it concepts that are not often applied in other areas of environmental law. The second thing is conservation biology. Um, I was very struck by um, Kate. Kate Jones' talk, loved your talk. I mean, I loved all the talks today, but particularly struck 
that um, first of all, conservation biology hasn't changed in kind a lot since I, I taught it for a year at Harvard in 2003. And you mentioned a couple of bold things like the fact that despite all we know about conservation biology, the trend lines are very bad. Um, I'm very much pro-conservation, very much pro-conservation biology, but something about it ain't working. And I love the fact that you then hooked it up to synthetic biology and biotechnology. For better or for worse, I think that you're right. I think that it's converging. And the third point is just that, biotechnology. After 40 years of trying to regulate biotechnology, we're still wrestling with the same issues. We're still wrestling with not, not just the highfalutin issues, but the basic issues of what to do. And in the meantime, science just races ahead and ahead and ahead. So I don't know if those are useful, but uh, I found today just phenomenally eye-opening. Well, I, I do think, and I'm very sadly, the fact that what we have been doing in conservation biology, with a few notable and wonderful exceptions, hasn't changed that trend line it is sobering. So actually, my, my comments were, I suppose, going to sound like they're going pushing back on something that you're saying now. Um, and I, um, so you know, this is my privilege to now be part of a second de-extinction conference, um, which shows you that de-extinction, if not the species that are being de-extincted, are alive and well. Um, I hope that is feedback and that I, my spirit is not singing to everyone. <laughs> there we go. Ah, resonance. That's one of the, nope, that's not it either. Okay, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. Um, Every AV thing that is going wrong today is going wrong. Okay, so, so I, I guess here's my... And that's why they changed the name of the mascot. So... No, 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 it's, it's, it's fine. It's just the banshee that keeps singing when I talk. So, um, I think it's, it might be too close. Your mic. Is it still too close? Yeah. Try the other one with this. God, this is just, maybe this isn't, huge. this is, yeah, maybe. There we go. So, I... <laughs> hardcore molecular biologists, people like George Church, and a lot of the ecologists in the room. And it seems like a lot of the concerns that everybody is bringing up, it seems like a lot of the problems that are associated with the extinction are, well, once we have them and we release them into the wild, then what exactly are they gonna do? Do we have, you know, I'm gonna say moral concerns, I recognize that that's not the correct terminology to use that. Um, is this really gonna be damaging to the ecology? Is it gonna be damaging to the political consequences of the ecological movement, so on and so forth? And I'm, I'm, I'm actually wondering whether or not it may make sense to pare it back a little bit, and rather than saying that, you know, um, thinking about the extinction from a soup to nuts perspective of, you know, we're gonna start off with ancient DNA, and lo and behold, we're gonna bring back entire ecosystems, whether it makes sense to focus on some of the molecular biology techniques that we're going to need to develop in order to kind of get there in the first place. And, and I think that maybe some of the reason why people aren't that thrilled by it is they think that that's a narrow view, is that we say the extinction, we want the extinction. We want to see you know billions of passenger pigeons flying over Columbus, Ohio. As a Michigan grad, I certainly do. Um, but you know that's that's that's. Right. <laughs> That's, that's the thing that we want, but there have been but there have been so many notable cases in molecular bi much of the advances that we've come to in molecular biology, the sequencing of the human genome, or if you want to go all the way back to learning about the existence of reverse transcriptase, have come with kind of more 
modest goals. I mean, of you know, one was developing a particular polio vaccine. I don't think anyone could have possibly imagined. Um, Try the mic now. Try the mic now. I think Roger is perhaps successfully that. Too many mics. Um, it started off with kind of more notable goals of, um, or, or, or more limited goals of exactly what we want to do for these big ticket projects. And by kind of defining it with those limited goals, we were able to bring the molecular biology techniques that we need to do to accomplish them into the four. I mean, my, my biggest concern is that for want of good ecological models, to successfully do de-extinction in the grandest sense of the word, we're going to end up throwing out some of the development of the molecular biology techniques that we need to do to do them, and whether or not that is in fact the best course of action. Um, some of the, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the sequencing techniques, a lot of the um, genetic insertion that that we. That, that has very real applications outside of the de-extinction context, they can be furthered by de-extinction as a piece of the puzzle, but should, those, should that piece of it fail because we have philosophers and ecologists saying that we shouldn't do de-extinction? And I, 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 I wonder whether or not the best course of action is in fact to split these things up. I want to react to one thing Jake said and then hand it to Hillary uh, and uh, of course, Beth, uh, or let them fight over it. Uh, but you know, he said he's been to, now to two de-extinction conferences. I think people, a lot of people in the outside world think this has been going on for a long time and has been talked about a, lo a lot. As far as I know, there was a small private workshop on the passenger pigeon in February of 2012. There was a larger quasi-closed workshop in Washington, D.C. in October of 2012. There was a TEDx event in D.C. at National Geographic Society, very public, the only, the first public event in March of 2013. And there's this, and a little bit this synthetic biology talk, uh, conference in the U.K. last month or so was peripherally related. As far as I know, that's it in terms of the discussion. So you've been at half of all the discussions <laughs> of de-extinction. And those of you in the room who've never heard, ever heard the word before have now been at 25% of them. I just wanted to oh, you, take, you take the one from Jake. <laughs> we'll see if it's just Jake. Almost certainly. I guess I just wanted to briefly comment on the, the, the statement about the molecular biology missing out because of de-extinction, I think. Um, I think that we have also used this argument completely reversed from that and said that de-extinction isn't going to suck resources from other things because the molecular biology is going to be paid for by all of the advances to human medicine and translational medicine and human health that will come from developing these genomic editing and genomic engineering technologies. And de-extinction really is peripheral, I think, to the molecular biology being developed. I mean, maybe sequencing ancient DNA, but people are genuinely interested in understanding evolutionary biology, which is why we're interested in generating high quality genomes of things like Neanderthals and, and Denisovans, because we want to know what in our genome makes us human. This is what's really motivating that work, not the idea that we're going to bring one of those back to life. I think it would be terrifying, terrible. Um, anyway. <laughs> Well, I was going to say part of what you said, but also that I think, okay, to the extent that molecular, I, I don't think molecular biology is going to be hampered really by anything that happens about de-extinction, except in the sucking of resources sense. I don't think in particular that if somehow philosophers acquire the kind of influence they would need to block de-extinction, molecular biology will suffer in any way. <laughs> but. Plato tried, but the, but I, I, I do think that I'm in favor of not pursuing some partial solutions. So when I said, for instance, that if, I, if we could just get the part about having the woolly mammoth sitting in somebody's lab or in a zoo or some, some small enclosure, but not get further, I don't think we should go there. I think that there are, there are, there are sort of little bits of gene splicing that would be worth doing 
regardless. And there would be wholesale introductions that would succeed, which might be worth doing, but that a lot of the steps in between there, you know, like the step where we successfully, you know, implant a fertilized woolly mammoth's egg into a, an elephant and the elephant possibly explodes, <laughs> or we bring, you know, we, we allow that elephant to get, or some elephant herd to give birth to say three bedraggled woolly mammoths with horrible birth defects who die a short time later. Those are things I think we really ought to skip until we have some assurance a, that it's going to be, that we're going to be able to succeed at something larger, and B, we've solved the rest of the moral problems that somebody other than me might identify. I just want to say that, uh, you know, we ha have only had a few of these meetings, and um, I think this is the first which has had a note of caution, Stuart. And I guess I would ask you, Stuart, has anything that you have heard today altered your um, vision of de-extinction? Because this is the most discussion about the morals and ethics that we've ever had. And I think, I, I think you know, taken aback by some of the talks, like Ronald and Jamie's in particular, about deconstructing this and thinking about the moral hazards. You know, it is quite worrying some of the issues being raised. And I'm just wondering whether that's all the perception of this or would that slow you down at all? Um, moral hazard. Um, okay, ethicist, define moral hazard for me quickly. It means something, right? There's a, I looked it up on Wikipedia once, but I forgot what it said. It's something about... Okay, just checking. Yeah, the most specific case, and I think it's a good one, is one that Jamie brings up, is basically, what do you say in front of the Senate committee? Are you going to push random buttons and see what happens? <laughs> you realize that's what God does. I mean, Darwin. <laughs> tinkering is... Evolution consists of nothing but tinkering. It's tinkering in patches all the way down. Intention is what we're talking about here. Um, sorry. Not yet. In terms of you know, if I deciding, oh my gosh, we got to get out of trying to do a de-extinction because of the uh, it gets somehow competitive with conservation. Um, it makes me more determined. It's making Ryan more determined, and I think Ben that we make completely sure that everybody understands that de-extinction and conservation are in no way competitive. And in fact, if we did not make sure now before there are any such animals, if such animals started to appear sort of randomly, somebody actually succeeds in finding some viable cells from a mammoth, not gonna happen, but if it did, and they started cloning a mammoth, you know, just out there without a real conservation approach, that would be problematic. But because we've got the advanced period of five or 10 years, to frame this up so that conservation and de-extinction, the potential for de-extinction, are seen as one continuous subject that ideally supports each other. And the way Ben puts it is that there's a generation of kids now who saw Jurassic Park and are expecting extinct animals back. There's another generation of kids who are starting to hear from now who want to see a woolly mammoth in the zoo and adore that first baby woolly mammoth. When they do, I think they will adopt a non-tragic relationship to what we're calling nature. And the non-tragic relationship to conservation with the sense that humans can actually do it right. They can even undo damage, serious damage like extinction that was done in the past. And that their century 
is a century where that kind of thing can and will happen and that they can participate in that. That's good news for conservation at so many levels. And I think we are yet to discover more things like that that will emerge. So um, I'm, I, I'm a conservation biologist at heart. I was 10 years old when I took the conservation pledge and uh, I'm living up to it finally as far as I'm concerned. So I, I guess I want to uh, ask a question of Kate. Actually, some, see, don't don't shake your head. Um, no, no, I, <laughs> no. But that follows up in the same sort of conversation. It's that it, it, in your presentation. It, it, it's come up throughout the day, but I think your presentation in particular was focused on priorities and figuring out priorities as between uh, potential extinct species, which ones to uh, perhaps would fall higher in the list than others. And I guess what I, what I was curious about is whether you think or others think about um, are those priorities uh, that you lay out also appropriate for deciding between endangered species and extinct species? And if so, are there circumstances, can you, I was having a hard time coming up with, but maybe you could, uh, come up with circumstances where the factors that you set out are likely to point to an extinct species having a higher priority over an endangered one. I don't I just don't see when that would happen because it's so much easier to do right because if you've got some stem cells it's so much easier to do yeah but they are recreating things which haven't got a maternal thingy God. <laughs> Well, if it's an extinct subspecies of something that's still alive, why are you doing that? Because it's an extinct subspecies of something that already exists. Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, that's one perspective, that's I guess. One, that's one yeah. factor. But I did really like, I don't know who said it, but uh, I did really like this. Was it you, uh, Stuart? You said um, that species which are extinct are actually just highly endangered. <laughs> species that are extinct are just highly endangered. Well, assuming you've got some genetic material. Yeah, uh, and I really like that continuum. I think the continuum is a, is a really good concept because then you can include <laughs> really, really, highly, really endangered. So, so Andrew, and then we'll go to the audience. I promise. Sure, I, I just had one other little thought um, today, which is almost everything we talked about implied that there was some central controller, some regulator, <laughs> some regulator, someone who actually, yeah, someone who could actually um, make sure that things didn't happen that we decided we didn't like. and. Again, Kate's my muse today, I think. Um, synthetic biology, in, in only a good way, don't worry. Um, in synthetic biology, there's, there's an ethos baked into at least, at least half of the community, which is um, to ignore the central control and to simply do it, to democratize the technology, to make it available to everyone. So it's all fine and good for us to have decided the um, trajectory that we're gonna take. But there may be kids in their garages who simply do it. There may be wealthy folks that decide that if they can't do it in the States, they'll do it somewhere else. So this is another big, big challenge for regulation. Maybe we have the best regulations in the world and the best intentions, and it may be irrelevant. It may simply be that these things pop up and pop up more and more frequently. Let's go to the audience. After Chuck says something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would just say that at the end of my comment period, which seems a long time ago now, I, I, I made a plea for a social contract between those in our different communities. And, and all I hope at the end of the day is, Kate, your question to Stuart, have you heard anything that might cause you to be of a different opinion? Or Stuart, your question back to Kate, um, have you heard anything that makes you want to come on board that each of us say to each other, uh, let's always start with, we need to be careful. 
we need to get this right if it's going to happen, because getting it wrong will be far worse. We have about as much control as I have over the microphone and who's talking, <laughs> which is not very much. But I would like to go to our audience members who have been waiting patiently. Cool. Or perhaps impatiently, but at least waiting. I think the batteries are dead in this microphone. What do you think? Batteries dead in the microphone? Can you hear? Is it? Yeah, no, batteries? Be louder. Be louder. OK. Uh, actually, do use the microphone, please. Oh, yeah, but I think it's dead. So it'll be a conceptual microphone. Um, <laughs> This one's not dead. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so I, this gets into you know the questions about the synthetic biology and conservation biology, and 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 sort of there's a lot of heat in this conversation, a lot of heat in the room, and I think that's what drew us here because it's a really hot topic. It's it's sexy. It's hot. It's scary. It's dangerous. You know, but. If we looked at this from the standpoint of a different kind of species loss that's as important, but much less hot, we're looking at microbial diversity. And in terms of soil science and agriculture, this is as critical a loss of species to our species as woolly mammoths and charismatic megafauna. Maybe even more so if we're looking at you know the survival of our species. So my question is, you know, I don't know if the biology is in any way relevant, you know, in reintroducing extinct bacterial strains as reintroducing woolly mammoths. But it seems like this area to sort of work out the bugs, as it were, you know, out of the spotlight where it just sort of takes a lot of the heat out and also takes out some of these ethics around like the minutes of agonizing life. And those kinds of questions leave the room so that some of the other questions and some of the science, frankly, can get addressed before we start getting into some of the scarier, uh, wickeder problems, as it were, and reintroducing and all the, the uh, integrity of the ecosystems and things like that, all are still part of the picture, but less of the sort of the, the things that make us more squicked about it, as it were. Bacterial work, anyone want to say something? Stuart and then I. I think that microphone may actually be working. I, uh, I'll just say something quickly and then hand it over, uh, can, if you can hear me. Uh, I, I would say that there are enormous differences in biology between what's going on. It is actually possible. Craig Venter has synthesized the entire prokaryote, I think, and, and brought it back to life from synthetic biology. So working out the scientific bugs with bacteria is, is in no way the same thing as working out the scientific bugs with, with um, eukaryotes. But um, it might actually be pretty important to understand what's going on with the prokaryotes, because one thing that uh, science is beginning to understand, and there have been some papers that have come out really recently and captured some headlines, is about the microbial community that lives within us. What is our microbiome? If we bring back a mammoth and we don't bring back its microbiome, um, is that in some way doing it a, another sort of uh, ethical disservice by, by bringing it back in a way that it, it can't actually survive because we don't understand any of these epigenetic or microbial or any of these other interactions that, uh, that were going on with that animal? I don't know. There's big, a lot of open questions that we haven't even touched on. My guess on the microbial thing, I mean, ecology is going to be associated Well, it is interesting to me that 
Dark energy is the biology of all that. And they just get so concerned and so involved. Is this, can you hear me okay? All right. Oh, great. Batteries, amazing things. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so I don't know if this is going to address anyone's concerns or not, but. In, in being the, the passenger pigeon guy, I end up getting, I only get to talk about, oh, these very optimistic, borderline impossible things, and I don't even get to talk with Beth. I work in her lab, and I haven't even gotten to talk to her a whole lot about more of the pragmatic. Well, including about doing media engagements. Exactly, right? Um, but that's part of the job. I'm supposed to garner support for it, and I'm supposed to, I get 15 minutes here or there to be like, oh, this is a grand plan, and give something to people. And, you know, uh, because this is only like the fourth meeting, nobody here knows what Stuart and Ryan and I are necessarily talking about with other scientists and other people. And every, every step of the passenger pigeon work so far that's been designed actually as part of what we want to do as a project versus what we say in, you know, to a journalist and what the grand kind of interesting idea is, is a little bit different. Um, we are starting to engage in conversations with uh, Department of Natural Resources. Um, they reached out to us, and uh, I'll be going to the Mississippi Flyway Convention in July to start talking about this topic to federal biologists and get an idea of what state government and local and federal uh, people have to say about this. We are looking at bringing together reviews on ecology and ecosystems and looking at a great deal of things. And I honestly, I don't think necessarily the... Uh, the science for this is definitely not moving at some sort of pace that's faster than putting in the right considerations. I do think there are things that are going to happen faster than some people think. I think we're going to be able to work around cloning birds, that kind of thing, faster than people think because there is interest in it by various labs for poultry and other things. And that's that kind of addresses... Uh, um, the idea of, you know, does molecular biology need de-extinction? No, this is the other way around. De-extinction, as what we're going to do, is really piggybacking on other things that are happening. And the types of things that we're trying to propagate for the passenger pigeon uh, are in no way, to me, distracting or negative because, let's say, it's going to take two, three years to sequence and understand the genome in any sort of fashion, and that's all you know, that uh, doesn't necessarily have anything negative impacting on anything because it, it doesn't even have to feed into de-extinction just to study the genome. That's all research. Having Robert Lanza's lab make stem cells from band-tailed pigeons can only offer more types of stem cells to research for a plethora of purposes, even if it's never used for de-extinction. Having the Cincinnati Zoo raise band-tailed pigeons offers their zoo goers and other species to see. It also propagates band-tailed pigeons, which are in decline in their natural range. So all the sorts of things that are going into the types of projects we want to do are being considered from an approach that I think is largely positive and weighs in on a lot of the things that have been put together as major questions. And we never get to talk about those too much. And uh, there's, I'd, I'd say there's a heavy, heavy amount more science with policy going on with at least my conversations I'm having with people than, than we ever get to talk about. That's it. Anyone want to respond, say anything? If this is not an immediate response. Okay, so you. Okay, uh, I don't know if this is working. Yeah. Try it. Speak into it. 
All right, is it working? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm just gonna back up a little bit. I have more of a question about um, definitions in relation to um, the subject of authenticity. Um, earlier on, we were talking about policy and we were saying that eventually once we like de-extinct a species, we bring it back into the territory of being an endangered species. Um, but then we also mentioned earlier that you might not have like 100% um, authentic species because if there's issues with recovering the DNA. Um, along that line, I was wondering what makes that different from making an entirely synthetic species in terms of like what differentiates that between being endangered versus something that you de-extinct, but it, you can't exactly guarantee it's like the exact same species that it, you're trying to derive. If that makes sense, I can try to clarify it again. But essentially, in terms of qualifying an endangered species, um, what's the differentiation between something that you de-extinct, but you're not 100% sure that it's the same species that you think it was, versus something that you make entirely synthetically? Because everything has to start with a template regardless. Anyway, anybody wants to take that on, I would, I would point out, apart from a, maybe arguably some bacteria, I don't know that we've actually created any living organisms entirely synthetically at this point. If we did, would it be an endangered species to the extent we create crosses between, you know, breeding combinations of hybrids <laughs> that don't exist in nature? I guess those could be endangered species. There's a, there's a scientific question, then there's a legal question. Right. I mean, so the question is, is it legally an endangered species or not? I think I, I, I went through the thought experiment as to whether it would apply, and I, I, I tend to think that there's a good argument to be made that it, in fact, would qualify as an endangered species because the definition legally is different than what people, the many different scientific definitions of what an endangered species is. I, I'm not sure any of them are the same as what it is under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, so, but legally in the United States, which of course may be different than other regimes, w arguably it could be considered to be an endangered species. I think what that points out is in fact the Endangered Species Act didn't contemplate de-extinction as a possibility in its framework. And so the question, yes, I could, we could try to speculate descriptively as to whether it would be under the Endangered Species Act or not. And I, and I think it's not an, a useless conversation, but I think perhaps the more important one is, should it be or not? Uh, and that's one where I understand and I completely sympathize with Jamie's idea that, you know, in order to engage in that experiment, you have to actually revisit the Endangered Species Act, and I don't want to in revisit that any more than she does, but if it's coming down the pike, these questions will come up, and we can either address them with the current frame or with some new one. Just, if I can just add, um, um, I, I, I would categorize um, wh whatever is the extincted, that's an action verb, um, as rare. Um, uh, I, uh, having lived through many, you know, multiple decades of debates among the taxonomists uh, on the definition of species under the Endangered Species Act, um, I would say that uh, everything to date would suggest that whatever the entity is we are de-extincting would not qualify under the definition of species or as danger, endangered, threatened under today's legal framework. Um, doesn't mean it's not rare, doesn't mean it shouldn't be protected, doesn't mean it, it's not special, but whether or not it would be afforded the protections of law, you know, invoking Section 7 consultation or incidental to take permits and all that, I don't know, I, I, I just increasingly today don't see it. So what about the example of a hatchery where there are groups who make, and courts are disagreeing as to whether fish in, a, in, in that sort of context are in fact a distinct population segment from the wild ones. How is, how, how, is this at least analogous to that sort of context? I, I don't think so. Okay. I, and the reason I don't think so, I think uh, it was brought up earlier. I mean, there is a huge split in the courts right. over um, uh, aquaculture mm -hmm. and whether or not hatchery reared fish or th uh, uh, particularly fisheries in captivity um, can contribute to the recovery mm -hmm. of the native species. Right. And uh, I don't think that's settled. And this takes it one step even further. Right. Um, so. Uh, uh, the, the, I think National Marine Fisheries Service will, uh, there's a huge debate. In fact, there was even debates between National Marine Fisheries Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service yeah. when we were dealing with Atlantic salmon. And it was a split jurisdiction, and the Fish and Wildlife Service would say, no, um, uh, 
aquaculture and uh, uh, Atlantic salmon reared in captivity is not a substitute for restoring sure. native wild Atlantic right. salmon because it was corrupt, so to speak. And so, you know, I don't know. species like the hatchery fish that are not, not the there's something we made I, I think <laughs> it, I, right but the element that right. triggers the translation Keep between the, the hatchery <laughs> and the protected is the element of wildness right right and that's the pivot point between the two sectors exactly. in the fisheries world Aqua advantages, it's it's called, cool. Yes, it's called aqua advantage salmon. So. Or frankly so fish, yeah. depending yeah. on who you ask. <laughs> so is that, that's a created species. So where does that fit? Does anyone know? So, and where are these the new, and all of these new created species that we've got, like wingless, drosophila, and hedgehog, and all the mouse strains, they're all new species too, right? Well, no. Or some of it's not, it's not. Jamie, Alex, or I that are worried about regulating as much as it is right. GMO yeah. and Jake and IP. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I do think it, Jamie's point about to the extent that the that your analysis is is going to stop at in, it not entering into some sort of ecological system, you're talking about cordoning it off so it's only consumed. Then that's less of a problem. But the moment that you're saying that ev eventually you want this thing. If it's not an endangered species, to be reintroduced into some ecosystem, and it's not an endangered species, I still think it raises massive questions that are at the forefront of endangered species. I think once you get into the beyond the captive breeding and into introduction, Section 10J or so, uh, that, whether it's yeah, I don't I don't know how you not consider that to be a unique entity. I hear the water call by name. But uh, okay. So, um, I, I, but I guess I would say if that if you're right about that, then I think this is really an ESA killer. That is, if we're in a position where anybody who wants to can, uh, you know, not anybody, but say Stuart can recover some species, release it, and now all the landowners in the Midwest are covered by restrictions on habitat use. Uh, you know, we're all subject to all these obligations to maintain this species that we didn't ask for. Um, I, you know, I don't see how the ESA could survive. The converse, in fact, which is the Pacific Fisheries Aquaculture issue, is from the conservation and the endangered species side, and that is there's been this fierce debate over whatever we do, don't release the hatchery fish because it'll swamp the native fish and thereby um, hybridize them and require the delisting of the fish and the deregulation and, and, and non-protection of the fish because they've been diluted genetically from what was originally listed. So it flips on both sides. Yeah, it's it's a, incredibly complex. We have a question from the audience. Uh, so my, my question goes towards uh, the, the sort of junction of philosophical justification and policy decision. Um, and, and it seems like we, we had a lot of um, Putting forth of cautionary and and your your use of humility, you know, we we don't want to be um, doing these big things without really thinking about the consequences. And I would want to hear your response to. Uh, it seems that these are very analogous um, issues that are brought up in climate change discussions, and that you know uh, one side will say we don't want to implement regulations, we don't want to use these technologies until we really understand what's going on. And that has sometimes been criticized as you know, doing too little too late, that we could have done more and we made a mistake by not having a sense of urgency to it. Um, and it, I was, you know, sort of get, wanted to get your impressions on uh, how that would play out in, in this policy decision that um, some people feel this is an urgent thing that we need to be correcting as soon as we're capable of, and how that will sort of merge with the idea of you know, we don't want to be you know sort of under humble about this and think that uh, there isn't anything we can do and there isn't anything we should do. Anyone want to take a shot at that, Hillary? Well, so I, I I'm not sure I see. De extinction. I'm, so whether whether it's desirable or not, I, I'm not sure I see it as as an urgent problem, except in the 
possibly in the case where something has very recently gone extinct, and it is a question of, you know, where the habitat is, you know, is somehow changing away from where it was, and you have to, re, you know, sort of, you have to reintroduce the species quickly. But I think that whatever there is to be said for bringing back, for instance, the woolly mammoth, I, I don't see why you would think that it is urgent, right? It, it may be many, many things, but urgent is not one of them. And to me, the, the difference is that in the case of climate change, you're looking at a problem that is rapidly approaching or possibly has already just blown right past the point of no return, and you want to figure out, is there anything we can do to stop this impending catastrophe? In the case of the absence of woolly mammoths, there is no, I mean, there's an ex what you might think of as an existing catastrophe that has exist for, existed for millennia of no woolly mammoths, which is continuing to exist. But it's not as though there is some again, sort of some impending doom that we must act now to prevent, right? So I think, I don't think the two cases are analogous at all, um, but I may just be missing something. I agree with Hillary, uh, with the one exception, or one kind of exception. So Stuart mentioned the case of pollinators. So imagine that pollinators uh, are about to collapse unless we replace a recently extinct uh, bee species or something like that, and we can do so to de-extinction, then you actually have a moving problem that you can't sit on. Uh, 